So we'll start off talking with search as a product. So what users want. So a typical user basically wants to get good search results quickly without thinking too hard about how to carefully craft which search terms go into the search. So number one should be a user friendly interface, right? And it's really hard to beat Google on this, right? Because you go to google.com. And it's really hard to fuck that up, right? Because there it is. There's a box for the search words to go in there. You just type in some words. Easy. Okay, back in the day, other search engines had uh, more complicated cluttered interfaces sometimes. Okay, second thing, immediate response. Even if we come up with some crazy mix of words that nobody's going to search for, surprisingly, we get them really fast. So if I do, let's say... Halloween, which is probably popular now, and what is something polar opposite of Halloween? Halloween Easter Bunny, and then Battle of Midway. Okay, that's a pretty jumbled mess. Nobody's searching for that. Boom, results in 0 0.71 seconds, right? Super fast. I could show you some results from Google's old, uh, like their stuff back in the 90s when they hadn't super optimized all this. They were running on old hardware anyway. Sometimes an initial search might take like 10 or 20 seconds. So I forget. I think the one they did was uh, the vice president back on the day, Al Gore, and it took like 20 seconds to do. Part of it is determining how many search results there are. So if there is a particular search that might be popular but within a big category, so sports, let's go with baseball, and let's go with best games, right? It's a big category. Let's see what happens. That took a little while. I felt, I felt the delay there. Wow, and they didn't, they didn't even give me a time with that one, so that's, that's kind of a dangerous sign. Usually they give you a time. All right, so that might have been a full second. I've never had one in recent years go above two seconds. Uh, it's actually, it's really slow if it goes, like, above a second. So it's almost, if I do some... Popular search. What's a movie that's in theaters right now that's popular? Joker, yeah. So when I do some common search like Joker Showtimes that you know is cached. Right? Oh, even so, 0.83 seconds. They must have to refresh for uh, in case something's changed. Okay, so that's much slower than I would have expected. All right. Anyway, pretty fast results. So we say immediate response, yeah. And last, relevant results. You want the results you have to actually be pretty good for what you're looking for. Okay. Now, between search engines, in general, relevance is the strongest differentiating factor. Any organization can deliver search results quickly if they're willing to cut corners on how good the search results are. For example, you compare with, uh, you know, Bing. Bing is generally going to have not quite as good search results. So let's say the one the one I used to do I found was kind of not a, not working so well anymore. So if I do, let's say, Doug Lundquist, IDS 201, and let's pick a semester, fall 2019. All right, I'm getting my YouTube stuff. I have a picture of Jesus there for some reason. I have this guy who I don't know who he is. Okay. But pretty quickly, it gets into some weird shit here, like bowler history. I don't know. I mean, I have on occasion bowled. And then things kind of fall off the wheels a little bit here. You know, by the second page, everything's kind of, yeah, most of it is not really the stuff. Okay, whereas, if I go to Google, and I run that same search, search, The better thing, knowledge card, they have some syllabus. For some reason, IDS 313, there must be a 201 mentioned somewhere. But pretty much all of this stuff, right, is stuff about me or uh, that's not me. Yeah. Anyway, I'd say in general, the Google search results are a little better than Bing's, especially for oddball topics. But you do common searches on Bing's like Joker Showtimes. They're not going to drop the ball there. Okay. Yeah, boom. You get the search results right away. Okay. So, right, if you give people bad results, that's going to waste their time and they're going to stop using that search engine. And 20 years ago, that was a big factor. What would happen is you were looking for some category 
And the sites would try to fool the search engine by basically packing the site with all sorts of random popular search terms, which meant that, you know, unless they had a more sophisticated analysis going on, that means all of those junky garbage pages would show up at or near the top of the search listings, making it hard for you to find out what you actually wanted. Okay, so correct relevance assessment does require additional data beyond simple term matches, right? We already talked about part of that the other day. We talked about exact term matches that you needed, but there's a little bit more context. So let me give, let me give a question here in paint. Ah, that font is too big. Suppose you're Google and in your search results, you want to distinguish between an actual shoe retailer and pages that just contain the words shoes for sale without any real content. What attributes or what do you look for? What would you expect to see on a retail page? Suppose somebody's made just a junky page that they have a bunch of random uh, popular terms uh, stashed in the text somewhere. One of those is shoes for sale and it might rank high in the search listings, okay? How would you distinguish between an actual retail site and a junkie page like that? What would you expect to see on an actual retailer's website? All right, good, pictures and prices, sure. Pictures and prices. What else, what's specific to shoes? Sizes, right? Shoe sizes. And what is a typical web object that you might use to select one shoe size over another for a particular, what's that? No, a specific web object. There's a little thing on the page. A drop down menu, right? Yeah, you click and say select your size and you click on like four, five, six, seven, you pick one. Okay, shoe sizes in drop down menus. Okay, how do you buy shoes on a retail site? What's the process? You add it to your cart. So you would expect to find a shopping cart, right? Because without adding things, that you're not really, yeah. Probably a shopping cart feature, okay? And how do you close out your transaction? How do you complete it? Well, what are the actual mechanics of completing an online transaction? Yeah, so you'd have to have some kind of some kind of input fields for credit card data, right? You'd need that because you're not just going to do an automatic, you're not going to assume that every customer can just click and buy now because some people have to enter in their data. So stuff like that, right? And we can add on to that, you know, navigation tools, sensible layout, that. Those are things that you would expect to find on a legitimate retailer site, okay? And so if somebody's just slapping together some junky page to try to get people to show up and randomly click on ads, they're probably not going to go to that much trouble, okay? The last supporting thing, you might even have supporting web analytics data available to Google, right? So you guys probably don't know this, but the big web analytics software out there that tracks what people do on your site the most popular one by far is owned and operated by Google. So quite often Google can see what people are doing on your site. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So that's the kind of idea, right? Basically relevance on page content, search terms, that's good. But for a particular category, like for retail, you would look for a particular thing. For movie listings, you would look for, you know, affiliation with a particular actual movie theater. And you would look for show times in different times, things like that. Okay. So, way back when, early internet search, before the World Wide Web, think again, think like 1990, internet search was a lot like searching for a particular file on a particular folder. And typically, you'd look for some matching names, types, metadata, like 
who was in charge of the research project that led to the files, or when were the files created, that sort of thing, right? You could try to find what you looked for, basically the same way as you looked for particular files on your own machine. Now, as the World Wide Web started to dominate usage, right, basically uh, what they used to call multimedia, a term you don't hear very much anymore, but things like images and video and sound, all that kind of stuff that was absent from the pure text version of around 1990, okay? Search engines started needing to match terms to not only exact text matches like who the guy in charge of the project is, but also to the, you know, the meaning. So, the first problem is this. Number one, what's the factor weighting gonna be? So if I enter in a search term, like we'll go back to this one, right? If I enter in Doug Lundquist IDS 201 Fall 2019, What's the relative importance of all those terms? Are they equally important? Are the ones that come first more important? Are the ones that come last more important, right? Which ones should you prefer in terms of how you're gonna deliver the search results? The second problem, okay, this. Your matching models are easily broken. If they're just based on matching particular search terms, then anybody can just say, oh, I'm gonna to slap together a junky page and figure out what the most popular terms are and bloop, 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 I'm gonna you know, get traffic to my page, right? For example, if the most popular searches of the day are Joker show times and uh, I don't know, naked pictures of your mom, whatever, you could like put all that all over the web page, and then, oh, it has the matching text, this site ranks high, okay? All right, so. Rise and decline of the search engine. So way back in the 90s, we had what should probably call, be called the Great Search Engine War. And in the Great Search Engine War, there could only ever be one survivor. So that's the way it works, internet and economies of scale and all that. So in the end, because of economies of scale, most of these search engines were not going to survive. Some of them still exist, but nobody really uses them. Uh, <coughs> the big one, that you've probably never even heard of. The big one around 19, uh, 1995 was actually something called Lycos.net, which still exists, last I checked. Yeah, there it was. 1995, that was the most popular search engine. And here it is, and it's probably like a uh, $2 million business. I don't know, which I guess somehow they make money. Okay. So a little bit of uh, background information there, but... There are two big things why Google won. Number one, a very simple ad-free interface. A lot of the early search engines, they were very concerned about getting enough money to survive. And so what they did, when you went to the search page, there would be a lot of ads all around, and it would be a little bit cluttered and a little bit hard to use. And because there were a lot of ads, the pages loaded slow, right? Whereas you went to Google, there were no ads, there's one text box, boom, you enter in your search and you're done, okay? So, simple ad-free interface, all else equal, Google was a lot easier to use, a lot more convenient. Second, their search model was eventually much better. They incorporated learning into it, and they were the first operation to really successfully do that. So, what do we mean by that? Well, again, one of the big things, a lot of people would actually do this with their sites. Even if your site was a legitimate site, you'd say, well, how do we get more traffic? Well, let's add on lots of search terms. So, for example, if you were, if you were a shoe retailer, even a legitimate one, you would probably want to pack your site with shoe related search terms in a jumbled mess hidden from visitors view. Okay, so what you would do is you would somewhere in part of your page, here's your page, and then somewhere down here you'd have this little box, and in that box you'd enter in all these terms and precise matches. So you'd have like men's shoes, women's shoes, kids' shoes, athletic, athletic shoes, blue shoes, black shoes, red shoes, dot, dot, dot. Size six, size seven, size eight. So whatever people were looking for, there would be an exact match. And then so it didn't really clutter up your page, you would hide it behind some big image, right? So all this text 
wouldn't be visible. So your site looked okay, but you'd hide this kind of content behind it, okay, which is a pretty cheesy thing to do, but that's what some of these operations did. So if you wanted to rank your site higher, you packed in all the search terms so you show up good for something. Another thing that we'll eventually talk about to make it work, extra links for no good reason and lots and lots of pages on the website, right? Those were other factors that tended to make your site ranked higher. So basically, sites were being artificially uh, re-engineered in order to rank high on Google search listing. What Google wants is for an actual good site that delivers what customers want, the way that that should be designed to rank high in Google's listings, right? Not this kind of uh, messing with the search engine algorithm. Okay. So, those two things, right? Simple interface and basically Google trying to figure out which pages are good, which pages are not good, and then among the pages that are good, coming up with a sensible method of ranking them beyond stuff like, oh, just look for search term counts. All right, so if you're interested, this is actually kind of a fun thing uh, to look into. Uh, why Yahoo lost in Google One was 20 years ago, they were locked in a battle to the death for who was going to be the big search engine. And it ended up being Google. Okay. So, relevance. Google wants to give high quality search results, right? Basically means it wants to give Google's searchers what they're looking for. Whatever terms you're looking for, it wants to give you a good match. Okay, so best and most popular results should be higher in search listings. And that encourages people to come back and keep using Google. Now, this is not as easy as you might think. Because for one, search terms often have multiple meanings. So, for example, eagles, right? There's a lot of different meanings to the word eagle. Number one, the bird. Number two, the football team. Number three, there was a 70s band called the Eagles that sold a lot of records, did a lot of drugs. Uh, what else? There was a $10 US gold coin called an eagle. Uh, the old Roman legions, like the big flags they carried around, those were called eagles. Stuff like that. Right. Uh, it wasn't technically a flag, but that's the closest description of it. Uh, anyway, so there's all these different meanings of eagles. And depending on what you're looking for, right, if I just type in eagles, it's going to guess football and music because those are the popular ones. Ooh, 1.5 seconds. That's shit. That's slow. All right. That's almost a new record. Okay, so Philadelphia Eagles, we got football stuff. I know there was something about eagles, the band here, uh, whatever, but mostly football. Okay, but on the other hand, if I enter in amplifying terms like Roman eagles, yeah, then you get the aquila, which nobody knows exactly what they looked like because none of them survived because they were made of gold and they all got melted down. Yeah. No, that's internal to Google. Yeah, that's how long it took Google to get it. Yeah. Anyway, so there's different meanings, right? And Google tries to do the best it can, and it's part of the, you know, the user's job to come up with alternate terms. So if I do, like, Eagles gold coins, of course, that's what I'm going to get. I'm going to get gold coins. All right. Anyway, so other thing, paid inclusion. So paid inclusion, number one, is something that Google doesn't do. They specifically say, this is not what we're going to do. So ideally, you could get relevant results by some sort of human-like analysis program, right? You'd have some sort of software that would say, oh, we have all these different sites. These ones are better. Let's put them at the top. That's what Google did, okay? Google came up with a set of algorithms that actually does a really good job of plucking out uh, which, you know, which sites are more relevant than others. But the alternative in many categories give preferential ranking for sites willing to pay an advertising premium. For example, if you have a search for shoes for sale, you have many shoes, shoe retailers, all of those shoe retail, retailers might be willing to pay you a little bit of extra money to have their site ranked higher in the listing for any search associated with shoes. So, the good thing about this is not all good, not all bad. The good thing about it is it tends to push down spam blog results. So spam blogs just think garbage, junky pages without any real content, just a lot of search terms, okay? 
because they're not willing to pay. The spam blog exists because they hope to draw some traffic and the page is packed with ads and they hope somebody randomly clicks on an ad. Okay? So the logic here is only a legitimate retail site would even be willing to, you know, pay like a nickel to be listed higher in the search listings. But the bad part is the search results don't reflect true, rel true relevance. So if you have, you know, say hundreds of shoe retailers, which we do, the fact that one of them is willing to pay a little bit means that many other shoe retailers, which might actually be a better match, they might not be seen in the search results at all. Okay? So generally, paid inclusion is avoided by Google, but there are some limited cases where it does it. Like, in, not, not in straight Google search, but like some of Google's uh, relevant things like marketplace listings, stuff like that. But for true search results, for true search results, anything that shows up here, let's see where we're at, gold coins, the ads people pay for, but these search results, you know, from here on down that aren't ads, all those are legitimate search results based on actu how actual users interact with it and what they click on and what users have found most relevant. Okay. So, one of the initial insights at Google, this was, you know, really actually the initial insight at, at Google, was that more important sites had more links. Okay, if you were a big established site, you would probably have a lot of pages, have a lot of links. You were important. You were a, a sort of a, a, a nexus for travel around the internet. So they came up with this so-called page rank algorithm, which is kind of funny, right? Because one of the founders' name was Larry Page, so haha. -ha. Anyway, they came up with this page rank algorithm that was basically the probability that some random web user who randomly visits pages and clicks on links in them would arrive at a particular page. And naturally, if your site has more pages and there are more links leading to those pages, it's more likely that a random visitor will end up there. So, important sites tended to have more pages, be linked to more sites, but this was correlation, this wasn't causation, right? It was just, this was how the world was. There were bigger sites that were well known this is how it worked. But this system is easy to mess with. Okay, so all else equal, pages with a high page rank would tend to rank higher in search listings. And back in the late 90s, this worked pretty well. But the problem is, it's pretty easy to manipulate your rankings. So, if search rankings are based on number of pages, number of links, and exact search term matches, how would a crappy site exploit that to rank higher? Sure, well, not blank, but make a lot of pages, probably low quality, but whatever. Hey, that's one thing. What else? Have those pages link to each other and to other partner garbage sites, right? So you have like one umbrella organization that creates tens of thousands of junky garbage sites each of those with many pages, and they all cross-link to each other, hey, they're going to look all of a sudden like, wow, this, this operation is pretty good. And last, pack site with random keywords, right? random search terms. Not really related to page title. Okay, So that's a thing. Imagine if you have a page that's supposedly devoted to selling shoes, Right? Your title will probably be, check out these shoes or something. But then if you look in and you find all this random text that's, you know, popular terms like today's weather or, uh, I don't know, who was popular in the 90s? Uh, I don't know, some 90s band. Nirvana was still around back then. I guess people like them. Uh, that sort of stuff, right? You pack all these random search terms into your page and you'd rank higher based on the text match and then based on having all these links and all these pages, even if they weren't good pages, you'd rank higher in the search listings, okay? Obviously, this is a problem because now users have to filter through dozens 
of crap search results to find what they actually want. Okay? And Google was the first operation to really solve this problem. Which is why, again, a big part of why they became popular is they devoted all this effort to making their search engine better. Okay. The other problem is this. Your search results also might be bad with PageRank just because it's going to excessively favor older, more developed sites. If you're a site that's been around for a while, you're going to have more pages. You've had time to link with more people. There might be many other pages out there that are actually a better match for what you're looking for. But because they're small scale and haven't had time to develop, they're not going to have those links yet. Okay. So, we'll talk about spam blog. So, a spam blog back in the day was basically a way to make money without having any good content. So, you'd pack the site with all kinds of popular search terms to try to draw traffic. Uh, often you'd use oversized pages, so you'd make the page absurdly large, like, you know, 10 times the screen area, and in all the invisible uh, parts of the page. Because back around 1999, you knew the biggest screen you were ever going to get to would be like 1,280 by 960 pixels. They weren't all that big. So if your page was much wider, much lower down, you know, you could pack all that excess territory with words that most viewers wouldn't ever scroll around to see. Um, you could also hide the text behind images. And you'd use lots and lots of ads, right? So that hopefully, and you try to obscure what the actual content was. For example, they still do that on clickbait. So give me a good clickbait title. You know, like 12 reasons why your girlfriend dumped you, you won't believe number seven. Well, what's a good clickbait title? No, no. I mean, I've been dumped and I've dumped people. Life goes on, but, you know. Sometimes. Sometimes not. Sometimes you're like, yeah, fuck you, goodbye. Yeah. Anyway, so where am I going? Let's let's look up something. Uh, I get a, I get a free car. A free car. Okay. Twenty tips for car shopping. How about that? That's probably clickbaity. All right. These all look okay. How to buy a car? No, these actually look like actual stuff. All right, I'm just going to go with the staple then. Uh, but celebrities? All right, 15 dumbest celebrities. How about that? That's mean. 15 smartest celebrities. All right, Business Insider. We're not getting good clickbait. Hollywood.com, that sounds like. TV Overmind, sounds clickbaity. What was that? Yeah, all right. That's not clickbaity enough. There are ads. It does kind of load slow and crappy. But this isn't good clickbait. We need some really garbagey clickbait. Let's, yeah, I know, but I don't want to. Yeah. I'm just going to go with my, uh, okay, 25 places to visit before you die. Okay? That sounds good in clickbaity. Places you'll see e-dreams. All right. List 25, list 25. That sounds clickbaity. I do like bored panda stuff sometimes. They're kind of fun. All right. This is good. This is clickbait. Okay. So see number one, lots of ads. There's stuff, right? See how slow everything loads. There's ads packed all around. I mean, the content isn't bad, but they try to hide stuff a little bit. Like here's an ad that I might accidentally click on or open. I don't know what this is. Oh, open. That's, you know, for stuff, right? So the ads are often kind of concealed and look a little murky. Yeah. How to get rid of belly fat. Well, if that actually worked, America would be thin. Anyway. Okay. So that's the idea with spam blogs. Now, what we saw there are not true spam blogs. A true spam blog actually has, like, nothing but ads. Most of these spam blogs, once they start getting detected and Google filtered them out of the search results, they gradually went away and essentially morphed into uh, clickbait pages. So spam blogs, they peaked about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and Google detected them better site analysis and user feedback. So back in the day under search results, there used to be a little option for report this site. So if you went to a site and it was garbagey, some user could click on that and Google would say, thank you for your feedback. And if a bunch of people did that, eventually the site would get dropped from the search listings. Okay. All right. So search data. 
<coughs> excuse me. Uh, Google has to continuously monitor web pages in order to return current high quality search results. Uh, basically, you know, they're looking at they're looking at trillions of web pages every day. Uh, they, I think like five, ten years ago, they were looking at a trillion a day, and now I'm sure they're looking at more. Uh, some content is inherently dynamic, right? For example, current weather stats or current sports scores, uh, stock prices, all sorts of things like that, or breaking news. Other times you can have changes to static data, right? Data that you would think wouldn't change, but there are occasionally revisions. For example, a uh, listing of courses at UIC, maybe something changes, right? Maybe one professor instead of another, or it's happening in a different room. All sorts of things can change even with static data. And of course, pages are periodically created or deleted, and Google has to incorporate that. So it's always sending out these uh, software agents, basically little uh, independent browsers, to go and scour the web and see what's out there. So ultimately, Google has to store a pretty current replica of what's called the surface internet. Basically, all the pages you can go to that aren't behind security features like password protection or uh, paywalls. Everything out there, Google's going to look at and it's going to maintain a copy of that. Even 10 years ago, Google was checking a trillion URLs several times a day. And I'm sure they're doing more now because there, uh, there are more websites now. Clearly, right, this is a big data problem. This is about as big as it gets. So we'll do a few more slides. We'll talk about spiders, and then we'll talk about hidden stuff. OK. So for Google. Gathering and using the data supporting search, right, because it has to have a copy of all these pages that it can consider before it delivers some of them to you as search results. So first part is crawling. Crawling is sending out these little browser programs to go and look at websites. So that's gathering the website, web page data. Next thing is indexing, uh, compiling and sorting the web page data. So every time one of its browsers sees a web page, Google, number one, pulls the complete page, and number two, distills certain important elements from the page, like page titles, stuff like that. Then, retrieval, when somebody enters a search, Google has to decide, okay, based on all this data we have, which pages are the best match. Okay, I have some descriptions here, they're pretty brief, but you can look if you want, you know, a little bit more, but we'll talk. Okay, so, crawling. Google has software agents that visit pages and gather links and other data. They're called crawlers, sometimes spiders. Google calls them Google bots, right? That's, that's their own thing, but generically crawlers or spiders. So after one page is visited, all of the pages that are linked to that page then get visited, right? It's this kind of one page is linked to other pages, linked to other pages. And if it's a page that hasn't recently been viewed, you know, the spider will keep looking at all those linked pages eventually. So what happens? Eventually, Google has a graph of the entire conventional internet, right? Basically, everything that's not the dark web. Uh, <coughs> updates, Google schedules repeat visits to check for page changes, right? Because sometimes things change. And it's based on popularity. If it's a page that a lot of people are visiting, that's going to mean the spider is going to come back more often, right? If it's somebody's crappy blog that only three people visit every month, yeah, Google's not going to worry too much about visiting that real soon. Uh, reliability, how often the site is up, because that's one of the indicators of a junky page, is that for some reason the site is down fairly often, whereas if it's a legit retail site, it needs to be up all the time. And update frequency. If Google frequently sends spiders out and you know sends them out 10 times a day and says, well, there's almost never any changes, it's going to start sending out the spiders less often. Conversely, right, if every time Google goes, there's some new stuff, like it goes to some uh, news website, and every time Google goes there, there's some new breaking news. Yeah, it's going to go there pretty frequently. Okay. So the tech supporting spiders. A Google bot, which is one of Google spiders, is a program that visits pages and copies their content. Basically, it's a web browser. So the simple program, what it does, it doesn't do any processing beyond reading the content and checking the links. So it visits a page, and all of that stuff that we see as HTML, the source code of the page, it pulls all that. It doesn't really do anything with it, except it tries to look in the page and recognize where there are links. So we saw that tag in the McDonald's example a little bit ago, the A, and then I did the href to mcdonalds.com. Yeah, anything that it identifies as an HTML link tag, it'll follow that and see what it finds. Okay? All the content that it pulls, all that page data, it sends to Google's indexing system. The bot says, I found this. Here's the page, you figure out what to do with it. That's where the Googlebot's uh, process ends. 
Also, sites can include a robots.txt file, right? Basically, a bit of text in the page that says, ignore this content. And the reason why you might do something like that, right, for uh, non for non malicious or whatever purposes, imagine if you have, well, I'll do a page. You have a news article, okay? Blah, 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 news stuff, blah, blah, world ending tomorrow, blah, 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 okay? And then down below that, you have a whole bunch of comments. Well, chances are, chances are people who search are searching for the article, okay? They're searching for this, not, not this. They're not searching for the comments, okay? So in your robots text file, you might specify, okay, this occurs in some tag that maybe we'll call this a span tag here, which is just a uh, kind of an HTML grouping tool. So we'll say, you know, robots.txt says ignore everything in span tag. Okay? That would be the idea. And you can think of other places as well where this might be done. But the simple thing is basically people are searching for this news article on the basis of looking at the article itself, not the comments people have. So you deliberately exclude the comments. Okay. Last thing, last thing for today. Tor and onion routing. You guys heard of Tor? Who's heard of Tor? Yeah? There was just a big thing on uh, CNN uh, a couple days ago in the news about how they busted some uh, child pornography operation and are probably going to arrest hundreds of people involved in it. So they were doing this stuff. So we'll talk. All right. So the deep web is the surprisingly large portion of the web that is not indexed by search engines, right? So number one, permission denied in robots.txt file. Arbitrarily, you could say just the robots.txt file says, don't look at anything in this page. Don't even archive this for search results. You could do that. Or stuff that's hidden behind paywalls, right? So you're not gonna, Google's not gonna be able to poke around behind a paywall because their Google bots are not authorized to make credit card transactions. And any kind of secured content, like email, financial accounts, private social media pages, right? I know a lot of people who would be pretty mortified if their uh, Snapchat accounts were made public, right? Or their email would be made public. So you obviously do not really want all this stuff to be out there. So there's nothing inherently bad about what's called the deep web. There's, for that matter, there's nothing inherently bad about what's called the dark web. It's a question of there is privacy, and like many things, privacy can be used for good or bad. So here we're going to say, this box is the whole internet, all pages, okay? And we're gonna draw a nice little curve here. Okay, everything up above it, boom. This is the surface web. Everything totally open to the public and spiders. Okay, that's the surface web. So I go to Amazon.com. Yeah, that's, that's open to the public. Okay, down below, do it in dark blue, we have the deep web. Okay, everything not visible to the public and spiders. And within the deep web, we have a particularly murky part called, as you might guess, the dark web. Ooh, so scary, okay. All right, I'll do that with pink. We have the dark web, anonymized access and hosting, right? Okay, 
So let's talk. Number one, dark web is a small part of the deep web often associated with criminal activity. You guys have heard of Silk Road? No, what? So that's a yes? You've heard of what, what was Silk Road? Yep, that was their big thing, right? You could buy, it was an online marketplace for illegal substances primarily. Yeah, because you can't really just run an ad in the Tribune, come buy, you know, come buy drugs from me. It doesn't work like that. Now, there was a fellow who went by the pseudonym, the Dread Pirate Roberts, which if you've heard of the old 80s movie, The Princess Bride, that they're talking about rebooting, that was one of the dudes in the movie. So I don't want to give you any spoilers, but he's a dude in the movie. Anyway, so the FBI guys, when they were going to bust this, they said, well, we want to bust this guy, but we don't have any way to track down who he is, right? We don't know who he is, and it's anonymous. We can't just track down where the site is hosted. So what are we going to do? Well, in fact, they were pretty clever, as you might think the FBI would be. And they said, well, this site is also equally anonymous and hard to find. So they had to do some advertising. They had to get the word out about the site. So what they did is they combed back through all the message boards they could find on the regular internet, and they found the earliest reference where somebody says, hey, I just found this great site where you can buy, you know, you can buy dope at uh, fair prices. Come check it out. Right? And they said, whoever, you know, whatever account posted that was probably either the guy in charge or one of his close associates. Turned out, you know, the earliest reference they found was, in fact, this guy. They busted him, I believe, at a coffee shop, you know, and he's kind of like, well, what took you so long? Uh, and now he's in prison for life. So. Okay. The others, right, the technology supporting this, number one, you have what are called Tor browsers. So Tor is basically a way for anonymously uh, visiting one site to the next. Uh, what it is, it's what's called onion routing. So every time you go from one site to another, the source of where you came from gets re-encrypted. So as you go from one site to the next, everything gets encrypted so that each site doesn't know who you are or where you came from. So you can, you know, use a search engine in that way, find stuff, get to wherever you want to be, and nobody, you know, in principle, nobody knows who you are. Although, interesting thing, the way they busted the uh, child pornography ring is they basically looked at the web page and on the web page data, on the source code for it, they found a, uh, an unencrypted uh, IP address. And so they tracked that down and they identified the guy and it was basically running out of a server in his house and they tracked him down that way. So Tor browsing is anonymous, but not everybody who's doing this shit has any, you know, a real idea about the tech. The other part, I2P is anonymous website hosting. So just like people who go online for this kind of uh, dark web stuff, they don't want people to know who they are. Likewise, if you are supplying this sort of content, like say Silk Road, you don't want people to know who you are either. So there's a mechanism for uh, anonymous website hosting as well. Okay, this is a good break point because then we'll come back and talk about indexing, but that's all I got for today. All right.